Yeah. 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 It's like a sword and a stone, but with a door. I would literally put my foot. That's hilarious. All right, so uh, bell ring for today. Can we measure consciousness? Uh, what two historical approaches try to answer uh, how we measure consciousness? There we go. So we talked about this yesterday towards the end of class. And, uh, you know, there we go. Uh, Campbell, good for a current event? All right, cool. Sounds good. Anyone watch the NFL draft in here tonight? No? Oh, okay. I'm excited for it. Anybody watch uh, President Biden's speech yesterday after the first 100 days? No? It came on pretty late, actually. It was like 9, probably like 9 o'clock, 9.15. Yeah, I watched it. I watched it. <clears throat> I usually watch that stuff, but I think there's a more way, a more efficient way to watch it. Sometimes it's funny to see the clips they get from the Oh, yeah. <laughs> I watch them a lot. I, I, I'll probably, we have time to get in the class and show it to you. All right, sounds good. I'm excited. Yeah, pretty pumped. We're going to get uh, Legends Pizza, Sweet Sauce, watch the NFL draft, and go to my brother's. Be cool. Okay, so can we measure consciousness? Can we do that? Is there any way we can do it? Is there? Sarah, what do you got? Like no. no, not at all. All right, well, I said obviously it's up. Just going off of the criteria to answer the question, like they're obviously pitfalls with both of them, and it varies with depending on people. There's just too many, like, mitigating factors to, like, really define how to measure it. Good. Good job. Good job. And what two historical approaches did we talk about yesterday that tried to uh, set up some sort of principles to answer what consciousness is? I said um, structuralism attempted to answer the question from my perspective. Good. It didn't really work because it was in a lab setting and because people vary. Like depending on what they experience, who they are, and I don't know. If, well, I mean, I know we took notes on behaviorism, but I thought that kind of took the mind out of it altogether. Good. Yep. Um, I didn't know if you were going for functionalism. Or awesome. Yep. So yeah, we talked about structuralism and functionalism, but yeah, behaviorism taking the mind out of it totally. And why did uh, behaviorism, you know, why did that approach really state that we should take the mind out of? Out of uh, when we're studying consciousness, what do you think? I feel like why did Watson want that? Good, good job, good job. At the time, especially 
uh, you know, with technology limited at that moment, at that time, Watson just said, well, we're going to take the mind out of how we try to explain what consciousness is because it's too complex, like you said, good. And uh, it really just is something we can't understand at the moment. We can't study. And now all of a sudden with emerging technology, which we're going to talk more about today, and uh, obviously with the effects of drugs, okay, uh, this obviously, obviously pushed behaviorism kind of on the back burner and said that, you know what, we have the ability now to look at the mind and understand where a lot of these concepts are being processed and, and uh, where, where, we can, where we can see where these functions are happening within the brain. But yeah, so real, real quick, structuralism, functionalism, we talked about that yesterday. And introspection was used heavily to try to answer what consciousness, consciousness is and set up and establish principles, but it was too hard. Right? Through introspection, everybody has a different type of perspective. Or perception of what a stimulus might be, or you know what it might, uh, you know what it might, uh, what it might mean to someone else. So introspection, structuralism did a great job in the lab setting, but okay, uh, there's a lot of I guess say pitfalls to it. All right, good, good. Is there any questions on that? And functionalism is just really our function in in the world around us. Uh, you know our our uh, I guess say our natural setting, how we react and act in certain stimuluses or you know, in, in certain activities, okay, in our natural setting. All right, so more like of a survival of the fittest type of thing, an evolutionary approach in a way. Okay, so uh, that's the bell ringer for today. I don't have any readings for you, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about consciousness and why we're trying to look back into the mind even more now. Okay, what's bringing the mind back into psychology? Because with structuralism, behaviorist, right, uh, approach, this was really kind of not answering what the mind can actually do. And we just talked about it last chapter, the chapter before, a little bit of the anatomy of the brain, okay, and understanding, obviously, sensation and perception, you know, where this is focused in the brain. So, yeah, now we have more ability to understand where these functions are being processed. Okay, where stimulus can be uh, perceived in the brain. All right, so like I said, the mind returns. One big reason is because of uh, certain things like drugs, okay, and uh, how we can maybe look at the brain even more, especially with memory, uh, with illusions, which we talked about last chapter, and then drug-induced states. So yeah, the 1960s, oh boy, what a time. What a time. <clears throat> but uh, many psychologists believe that, yeah, we need to focus a little bit more on the mind and understand exactly how the mind can be affected, uh, be affected with drug use, okay, in our states of consciousness, especially with, uh, with people being sedated and, uh, under the influence of drugs. So how illusions, okay, play a role with our mind and how that might skew our perception of certain stimulus and obviously memory okay how can memory be played and understand with uh, scheduling uh, with us with our objectives in our mind All right another reason was well, is just because of technology right technology advancements so innovations in technology which allows us to see the mind and understand it where this is being processed in the brain as we're presented to certain stimulus, uh, where we can understand fully our perception of the outside world and uh, activities that we do perform. And like I mentioned, just really analyzing the brain and the technology advancements help us understand it a little bit more. So cognitive neuroscience involved in cognitive psychology, neurology, biology, computer science, and linguistics. So, like I mentioned, this is really putting a dagger into behaviorism and uh, the behaviorist approach and how, obviously, they try to take the mind out of how we interact with the world around us, okay, through conditioning, right, and through uh, operant conditioning, classical conditioning. Yeah, they're, uh, they're justified. Yeah, we can believe many of that being correct and understanding, but we need to really just focus more on the brain exactly how we interact with the world 
disabilities, impairments to the brain, you know, may cause some certain people to act certain ways. Different experience. All right, another thing that consciousness we always try to ask and try to understand is how we multitask, right? How we can multitask. We know the conscious mind can really only focus on one event, one thing at a time. Okay, I think we all can agree to that. But uh, through certain forms of consciousness, we, uh, we can parallel process. Uh, we can perform multiple tasks at once. But overall, right, we only can focus really on one thing and then another. So this guy here, this picture, oh, look out. Hopefully no one ever does this. Eating and driving, on the phone, texting and driving. You don't do that, Sarah, do you? You better not. You better not. Booker, do you do you have your license? Eating while driving is not too bad. Really? I mean, as long as you don't. It's like a bird. A smorgasbord, right? I don't know. I always so I'm like really like a clean freak with my car. Like even if I see a grain of you know grass, you know just a, you know, a thing of grass, I'm like I gotta get it out of there. So I never eat in my car just because I don't want anything falling on me. I feel like disgusting after. Like, on my yeah. Right. I vacuum. You know what shell I vacuum? Oh yeah, yeah. Like fifty cents. I do that twice a day. Do you? never gets touched. There you go. Nice, nice. <laughs> I put the what's that? So it's worth it. Oh yeah. I guess so. I guess so. I'm always just afraid I'm gonna get all over my seats or in the cracks, like or alongside the console. I hate when that happens. One time I was eating Taco Bell and just all over my jacket and then down into the cracks. I'm like, I don't know how I'm gonna get that other than taking the seat out and trying to clean it out. But you know what zesty sauce is from. Burger King. Yeah, we talked about that uh, the other day, I think. Well, one time, my friends and I went to Burger King and just spilled zesty salt all over the seat. Isn't that the worst, huh? Where you get the spray and scrub it. So it. Oh, do you get it out? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's nice. That's nice. Oh, zesty sauce. I'm not a big fan. I'd rather have the Big Mac sauce, to be honest. Too much like pickle onions in there, I think, for me. It's too like chunky. For me anyway. Yeah, I love this. All right, so with multitasking, like I said, it's not what you think, just because our conscious mind can only focus on one thing really at a time. And then once that objective for a certain time, let's just say it could be a, a fraction of a second, then we can focus on another objective. Okay, so texting and driving. I hope no one really does it a lot, but it's kind of hard not to in some cases. And, uh, yeah, picking up the phone, we have to look at the screen. We have to focus on where our thumbs are hitting, obviously, the, the buttons to text a certain word out. Okay, so our mind does attract to that. It's not like we can multitask and see the phone and the, and the road at the same time. We can. We can. And hitting the pedal and shifting and whatever it might be. Does anybody have a manual car? No? Do you know how to drive stick, Campbell? Really? I thought you of all people know. Oh. Sarah, do you know how to? No. Booker? No. Hannah, do you know how? To? Oh, man. Oh, man. I'm kind of okay. Yeah, I'm okay with it. The one time I was driving stick shift, it was a work truck. At one place I work in Clingerstown. And their shifter is a little bit weird. So the first, uh, you know, in, uh, first gear is right far to the left. And then usually second is... Directly behind, like just move it right back, and then third, fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever it might be. But for some reason, the work truck. It was uh, first, first you know the gear one, and then I moved it back. Thought it was gear two, but it was in reverse. So I threw it in reverse, stopped on a dime. The trucks shut off. I looked at my friend, which is actually Mr. Dietrich's son. He was like, "What? What happened?" He goes. I don't know. Throw it in neutral and try to start it up and then start it up fine. But that could have really been bad to the transmission. Oh, usually reverse. You got to like push down on the shifter and like put it like far at the other end. But oh, well, it is what it is. All right. So the non-conscious process. <clears throat> so this is really where we can really focus on certain things at the same time. And 
multitask, really. Okay, so the non-conscious mind is great at multitasking. So the conscious mind has the ability to focus on one task. The non-conscious mind has no restrictions. There's multiple things we can do and focus on. And like I talked about with Freud, okay, he was always trying to hack into that non-conscious mind and see the full potential of what the brain can really do. And obviously, it's really hard to show exactly how that works. Okay, how do we how do we state the non-conscious mind is really a thing? How can we show that it and and study it and try to uh, set principles of how to hack into this non-conscious mind? It's really understandable. Okay, well, not understandable. But the conscious mind has to process things securely, while the non-conscious mind can handle many streams of information at the same time called parallel processing. So parallel processing, like I said, is just when we can focus on a certain thing, okay, and perform other tasks, multitasking, at the same time. So walking, chewing gum, and breathing. Right? We all can do that, right? Some of you anyway. <laughs> but a uh, non-conscious mind can perform a lot of tasks where our conscious mind has to focus on one certain thing. And like I mentioned, Freud was always trying to break into that non-conscious mind, see the full potential of the brain. A little harder said than done. Even today, with the advancements in technology, it's still hard to prove that. All right, so real quick, our consciousness has three main functions. One, consciousness restricts our attention. Okay, so we have to focus on one certain thing, and it's called selective attention, obviously. And we went over that already. So it keeps our brain from being overwhelmed by stimulation, by processing things, and limiting what we notice to think about. Okay, so selecting our attention to one specific thing. So when we're driving, we should just focus right on the road. We shouldn't be looking at our phones or trying to eat zesty sauce with a Burger King burger or something. Or to use it with the onion rings, right? Yeah. That's right, that's right. So selective attention. All right, I talked about this before, the cocktail party effect. So this is our ability to block out background stimulus, any type of stimuli around us, and focus on, let's say, someone talking. It's really self-explanatory, like you're at a party, okay? And there's a lot of people communicating. There's a lot of people talking. There might be music playing in the background. Uh, there might be people dancing. Uh, but uh, if you're having a conversation with someone, you focus your attention on that person to communicate with them. Everything going on in the background is just really just noise and stimulus that is not being processed at that moment. It's just kind of going in the background. So that's what they call a cocktail party effect, where our selective attention is focused on one stimulus, one person, let's say, having that conversation with us. While there's still other noise going on, there's other, there's other stimulus going on around us. So, like an activity, let's, I always bring up football especially. If someone's going to catch a football, catch a pass, they can block out, obviously, the, the, the communication, the fans screaming, uh, you know, the, uh, the people cheering you on, let's say, uh, the refs running to the ball, okay, the noise from the, let's say, the bleachers, like I said, the fans talking, cheerleaders doing their cheers, okay, they can focus their selective attention on that ball, okay. All right, two. Consciousness provides a mental meeting place. So where sensation combines with memory, emotion, and motives. And uh, some people call this the binding problem. Now, obviously, there's a lot of sensation going on. Uh, there's a lot of stimulus being presented at one moment. And it's up to us to really sort through that and uh, really select our attention onto something that we, we see or view as valuable at that moment, at that time. Okay, yeah, we might have a lot of things going on in our mind. Uh, yeah, there might be a lot of emotions or memories being brought up when we talk to someone. Okay, but in many cases, we can sort through that and, and focus our selective attention, let's say, on that conversation we have with someone else. But the binding problem, real quick, a binding problem is when we have all the stimulus going on at one time and we can't compute, we can't process it. Okay, it's almost like when you're reading in a, in a crowded room. I know that happens to me a lot. Whenever I'm reading somewhere in a crowded room or someone's talking or the, you know, the TV's on or my brother's playing music or uh, let's say the vacuum cleaner's going on, I, I can't focus on the reading. There's too much clutter. There's too much stimulus going on around at that moment. 
Okay, that's what they call the binding problem. I'm sure everybody has experienced that before. I know I talked about with my buddies. My buddy brought his his boys over when we were trying to watch the Packers. They're screaming, they're yelling, they're trying to play a game, they're trying to play, uh, you know, the Wii, whatever it might be, and in in the corner. And I'm trying to focus on the game. I was like, I can't focus on this game. I'm going to unplug, unplug the Wii, and oh man, unbelievable. They're screaming and yelling all over the place. Or with my aunt, my deaf aunt, when I was trying to watch TV, I unplugged the vacuum cleaner. Average go down. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. That's terrible. That is really mean, isn't it? Oh, well, she got over it. All right, three. Consciousness allows us to create a mental model of the world that we can manipulate. <clears throat> so with the binding problem, yeah, that's really hard to sort through a lot of stimulus coming on at one point. And like I said, there's a lot of things going on in our mind, let's say memories, experiences that we think about, even with a conversation that we can try to relate a conversation to uh, with past and present memories. <clears throat> so with this, with that being said, number three, we have the ability to set objectives, to plan scheduling. Uh, we, we, we can plan for the future. Okay, we can set goals for ourselves. Okay, in our conscious mind, we can remember this, obviously, moving forward and uh, understand what needs to be done at a certain time and uh, make sure we have our assignments in by the due date. Okay, so planning and setting schedules and, and planning goals. Okay, that our conscious mind has the ability to remember that information and prepare us for that certain objective, whether it might be a test, whether it might be an assessment, or just a game. Okay, where we need the knowledge to retrieve it to accomplish that objective. All right, so um, metal imaging. Oh, this is kind of cool, I guess. So with metal imaging, what, let's try this out. So close your eyes, picture a cat. So close your eyes, picture a cat. So I'll give you like a few seconds to do that. So picture a cat. All right, so I did that already. So I did that. Sarah, what cat did you picture? What, what does it look like? What does it look like here? Honestly, we have a cat. He's always gray. He's gray, okay. Small. Small? Is it like uh, really furry? No. No? Okay. Okay. So he's just gray, no other colors. He's like white on his paws. Okay, he's white on his paws. So I had to think about it a little bit, right? Yes. Yeah, a little bit. Mostly okay. Gray. Well, all right. Okay. Uh, does it wear a collar? Yeah. What's on the collar? Well, it's purple and it has the address and phone number taken Does it say his name? Yeah. Okay. Cool. What about his ears? Are they standing straight up? They kind of pin down like a normal cat? Yeah. Bushy tail? Not really. No? Well, how is it? Is it not really bushy or no, not really. skinny? It's like a normal okay. All right. Okay. What type of uh, what type of funny things does he do? Does he do anything funny, or is he just kind of lounge around, or does he hide? Try to yeah, stay away from people. Is he personable? Really? My old cat when I was younger at my my mom and dad's house, he used to always. Is it his name or her name? Was it was Isabel? Always laying at her arms up like this. It's like, what? Really fat too. <laughs> Funny. What are you doing? <laughs> All right. What about you, Mikhail? What cat were you thinking about? Just a random cat. What color is it? Orange and white. Is it striped like a tiger or something? No. Just white underbelly. Oh, okay. All right. Is it big? Collar on it? No. Okay, sharp teeth. Stinky breath. No. No. Okay, all right. My cat has a stinky breath. I can't stand it. Can't stand it. What about you, Campbell? What type of cat are you? You think about a jungle cat, like a jaguar or something? A panther? No. Oh, okay. I just thought of a black cat. Just a regular black cat. Like from Sabrina the Teenage Witch. I don't know what that is for sure. Are you serious? You never heard of it? No. Oh my. Okay. So just a regular black cat. Is it yeah. furry? Well, I mean, 
What do you mean? I mean like, does it have long? <laughs> does it have long hair? No, it's just normal. Oh, okay. Usually, black cats when I see them, they're just like really fur. They have like a long hair. It's like, ugh. No. No, not this one. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> not my Mendel cat. Not my Mendel cat. <laughs> not what I'm thinking. No. Collar on. No. Oh, okay. So like a barn cat. Sure. Okay. All right. Campbell, what about, or Hannah, what about you? Orange. Just orange. Oh, okay. All right. So like I said, uh, you know, with metal imaging, we think about certain cats, okay, and uh, we never really think about the certain details about it, okay? Uh, obviously, I was trying to pick apart, you know, the, your guys' cats a little bit too much. It's like, oh, is it fur? Does it have long hair? Does it wear a collar? Does it, you know, what kind of funny things does it do? And uh, with the conscious mind, when we focus on a little bit more our answers, obviously, we don't, we don't really, really think about it. We think of a broad image. We think about the image as almost like a whole, especially in this case, a cat. My cat, it's like brownish, I don't know, black. And even underneath of its like basic fur, it has like orange, like an orange lighting underneath it. It's pretty sweet. He actually looks pretty cute. I don't know if I ever showed you an image of my cat picture, did I? No? I chucked it, but I don't think you saw him. I don't think you saw him. I'll try to find a picture of him. He's the devil, though. He's actually been easing up to me, though. He's, I he's been all better. Stuff, you know, like the mental imaging. That's what I was always, like, I brought up the other day. Like, if you're blind, you've never seen your whole life. Yeah. This, or, I guess not. It's like, going to be altered, maybe. Yeah. That will, that will always bother me. Like, I will never know the answer to that. That's true. Unless, well, no, even if I need to. Yeah, so you're, you're, you already have a conception of what, yeah. you know, yeah. these these things look like already. Like, what do you see? In my, and they don't know what letters look like and stuff, or colors, so it's like, yeah. what even goes on in there? And I, I huh? Yeah, how do you want it done? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't know. Couldn't imagine not knowing what people look like or. What items in there, what, what things look like. It's crazy, crazy stuff. All right, so mental imaging, uh, like I mentioned with our conscious mind, when I when we start focusing a little bit more on certain details, it takes us a little bit longer. Uh, it's like, oh, yeah, you know what? My cat does wear a collar. Uh, yeah, you know what? Uh, he, he does look like this. Uh, he does have like a little bit of white splotches on his belly. Okay, and that's kind of where I was getting at with the conscious mind. Okay, when we have to specifically pick out detail, it takes us a little bit longer to retrieve that information and base it off of certain memory and experience. All right, so level of con unconscious mind. Last thing I want to go over real quick. I know I talked about this before with Freud's uh, iceberg theory with the ego, superego, and the id, right? Okay, the unconscious mind, the preconscious, and the conscious. So the pre-conscious memories or information that is not currently in our consciousness, but can be recalled voluntarily. And uh, that's kind of what I was getting at with asking about the cats. It's like, oh, yeah, you, you, you forgot to mention about, you know, obviously, the collar that he's wearing. What does it look like? What does the collar look like? Does it have a bell on it? Does it give the address? Uh, does it give his name? Uh, this is obviously information we can retrieve pretty quick, but at the moment, we're not thinking about it currently. Does it have longer hair, right? Is it, is it a big cat? Is it fat? You right? can give broad explanation of it, but when asking about specific details, that's in our pre-conscious mind because it's not at the consciousness what we're thinking about at that current time. Unconsciousness is cognitive thought without awareness. So it involves level of brain system that range from autopilot to those which we have several influences on our consciousness and behavior. So a lot of times in our unconscious mind, we can visualize and see it, especially when we're dreaming. It might be fears. It might be interests that we might have. Okay, It might be pleasures that we try to hide, obviously, but in our dreams, anything's free game, and I guess you could say. And now uh, we talked a little bit about dreams yesterday. We're going to talk a little bit more about it in the upcoming chapter. All right. Any questions? You guys good? That's all I have for today. That's all I got. So what are we going to show me, Sarah?